إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله All praise and thanks be to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is no doubt our creator, sustainer, nourisher, protector and curer. We ask him Jalla wa'az to shower his choicest of blessings and salutations upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, his family members, his companions and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of Qiyam. O slaves of Allah, my dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, First and foremost, I advise myself and then all of you all present here to adopt a life of taqwa. And that is to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be conscious of Him jalla wa az during every single second of our lives if we wish to attain success in this world as well as the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all from the people of taqwa and may He make us from the victorious and successful ones. Ameen. In regard to today's khutbah, I'm going to be touching on a beautiful quote from my beloved teacher Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah. But before we go into the quote, I would like to point out that according to the Gregorian calendar, a year has come to an end and a new year has commenced. And I'm sure most of you might have witnessed the festivities, the celebrations, the people celebrating and whatnot. But for us believers, what message do we derive from this? Let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture. And what do we realize? We realize that a year has come to an end, that is according to the Gregorian calendar, and that we have gotten closer to meeting our maker subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have gotten closer to meeting Malakul Maut. We have gotten closer to our graves. The question that you and I, we need to keep asking ourselves often, is that are we ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are we ready to meet our maker? And we also need to understand the value of time. And we need to realize that time is slipping away from us. It's as if 2015 just commenced and here we are, now at the inception of 2016. Time is slipping away so fast. And this itself highlights the fact that we are so close to the day of Qiyamah. Doomsday is just around the corner. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ease the reckoning upon all of us. So let us use this valuable commodity, i.e. time that we have with us. This is a blessing from the number of blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with. So many blessings. Our lives are permeated. Our lives are saturated in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well as the bounties and favors of Allah azza wa jal. If we were to try and count these blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we would fail miserably. As our maker rightfully states in the Noble Quran, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا That if you were to try and enumerate the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you were to try and list the bounties, boons and favors of Allah azza wa jal, لَا تُحْسُوهَا You would not be able to encompass all of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, each and every blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a set of rights upon it itself that we need to fulfill each and every blessing has rights that we need to fulfill and the the blessing of time it has its own rights that we need to fulfill we cannot kill time we cannot while away this valuable blessing that we have with us we need to use it we need to use every single second of it to do as much good as possible to please our maker subhanahu wa ta'ala and to secure a good life in this world as well as the hereafter may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Open the doors of understanding for all of us. Ameen. Okay. Now in regard to the quote by Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah. Amazing, beautiful, profound words. And this is from his famous book Al-Fawaid. He rahimahullah, he states, إِضَاعَةُ الْوَقْتِ أَشَدُّ مِنَ الْمَوْتِ إِضَاعَةُ الْوَقْتِ أَشَدُّ مِنَ الْمَوْتِ لِأَنَّ إِضَاعَةَ الْوَقْتِ تَقُتَعُكَ عَنِ اللَّهِ وَالدَّارِ الْآخِرَةِ وَالْمَوْتِ يَقُتَعُكَ عَنِ الدُّنْيَا وَأَهْلِهَا Amazing. The wasting of time, idha'atul waqt, ashaddu min al-mawt, is more severe, is something more serious than death. Idha'atul waqt, ashaddu min al-mawt. Li'anna idha'atul waqt, taqta'uka anillahi wa dhari l'akhira. Because the wasting, the whiling away of time, cuts you away from Allah and the eternal abode of the hereafter. Whilst on the other hand, wal-mawt, yaqta'uka anillahi wa ahliha. Whilst death, on the other hand, cuts you away from dunya, from this temporary life and its people. So from this particular quote, there are a number of lessons that 
can be derived. So let us expound this quote of the Imam, inshallah ta'ala. He's striking a comparison between the value of time and death. The value of time and death. And from this particular quote, we understand that time is life. Time is literally life. Because as time slips away from you, there's going to be some point, because we all have to inevitably face death, as our maker states in the Quran once again, Kullu nafsin maut, that every soul shall inevitably taste death. So we all have to taste death, whether we like it or not. We all have to face malakul mouth. And none of us, we don't know as to how much time we have remaining. It's like a sand glass. You have the grains trickling. None of us, we don't know as to when malakul maut is going to come in front of us. We can't even at times guarantee that we would make it out of the doors of this masjid. We can't guarantee. We don't know. We don't even know whether we'll make it home today. What if we were to encounter malakul maut on the way? Are we ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are we ready to go to the eternal hereafter? Have we done enough? Have we secured investments that will reap great benefits for us in the hereafter? So Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he states that wasting of time is more severe than death. Because the more you waste time, you're losing opportunities to secure amazing investments. You're losing opportunities, you're losing the valuable seconds to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is more severe than death. Because the minute death comes, yes, obviously you're going to leave this world, you're going to leave your loved ones, you're going to leave everything, but you're moving on to that which is permanent, that which is eternal. This is a short life. According to one particular narration of the Prophet sallallahu wasallam, the lifespan of my ummah, along the lines of these words, the lifespan of my ummah is between 60 and 70. 60 and 70. A very short span that we have. But on the other hand, the eternal hereafter is forever and ever. Khalidina fiha. We're going to live there forever and ever. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open the doors of Jannah for all of us. Ameen. Ameen. Let me give you a rough uh, calculation. It's just a rough calculation, but to give you an idea about how how futile this worldly life is and how time is just fleeting away from us. We just mentioned a narration that Rasulullah his report to have said that the lifespan of my ummah is between 60 and 70. So for this calculation, hypothetic, hypothetically, let's take an individual with a lifespan of 60 years. Now this is not something that we can guarantee, like I said earlier, but just for the sake of the calculation, let's take an individual who has 60 years of life blessed to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 60 years. From these 60 years, how many hours do you think an individual sleeps during a given day? An individual generally sleeps around, and this is something based from surveys held by certain sleep foundations, an individual generally sleeps for about 7 to 9 hours per day. So let's go with 8 hours to uh, simplify the calculation. 8 hours, listen to me attentively, 8 hours is basically one third of a normal day, 24 hours, one third. So from 60 years, you're spending one third of it sleeping. One third of it sleeping. 20 years of your life, you're spending it. That is if you have been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with 60 years of life. None of us. I mean, if I'm 30 years old, I don't know whether I'll live up to a ripe old age of 60. None of us can guarantee. But this individual who has been blessed with 60 years for the sake of the calculation, 20 years of it he spends sleeping. How many years has he got left? He's got left 40. He's got with him 40 years remaining. Of these 40 years, let's say for, okay, yes, from the 40 years, he's not held accountable for a given amount of years until he basically reaches puberty. So normally, a, a boy generally attains puberty at the age of, say, 13 to 15, a girl maybe 12 to 13. This is on average because today with the you know, genetically modified food and whatnot out there full of hormones, people generally, kids generally tend to attain age much sooner. But let's say 15 years for the sake of the calculation. 40 minus 15. How many years has this individual got left? 25 years. 25 years. Okay, breakfast, lunch and dinner. Breakfast, lunch and dinner. On average, we spend around two hours per day, a lengthy calculation, but let's knock off about five years for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and some places, supper, brunch, high tea, and whatnot. So you're left with 20 years now. Of these 20 years, how many hours do you think you spend at work? On average, eight hours. We're not going to go with accurate calculations here, but let's knock off about 10 years, because if I were to go with precise, accurate calculations, we won't be left with anything. We won't be left with anything. 
So let's knock off 10 years. From the 20 years, 10 years. You've gotten another 10 years remaining. Okay, what about recreational activities, chilling with friends, hanging out, you know, all of the hobbies and whatnot people are generally involved in? Let's knock off five years for that. Five years for that. So how many years has this individual now got remaining? Five years. Five years, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, to do as much good as possible to secure an amazing life for him in the hereafter. This is how fleeting time is. It's so futile, this worldly life. 20 years we spend sleeping. Allahu Akbar. 20 years sleeping just like that. Five years eating and drinking. So don't you think that we must value the time that we have with us? Every second is priceless, literally priceless. Even if you were to spend a million pounds, you're not going to get the second that just passed by. You're not going to get it back. So do as much good as possible, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa report to have said, Ni'matani mabun fihi ma kathiru min al nas. That two bounties, two favors from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, people are generally deceived and cheated about. Two favors. And they are as sihatu wal faraq. Health and free time. Health and free time. So when you are healthy, when you do have time at your disposal, make the best of it and do as much good as possible. Because remember, I've said this before, but there's no harm in re repeating it. The only size of regret of the dwellers of Jannah, the only size of, the re of regret of the dwellers of Jannah will be that, oh, I should have said one more subhanallah. I should have said one more alhamdulillah. I should have said one more Allahu Akbar. Because if I had said one more subhanallah, if I had said one more Allahu Akbar, if I had said one more alhamdulillah, if I had said one more la ilaha illa Allah wahda, la sharika la, lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamd, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir, a tree would have been planted in my orchards in Jannah. A palace would have been built for me in Jannah. Another quote by Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he states that when a, a, a slave of Allah remembers Allah Azza wa Jal, inna dur al-jannah tubna bi dhikr that the palaces or the stages, the levels in Jannah are being built by the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَإِذَا أَمْسَكَ الذَّاكِرُ عَنِ الذِّكْرِ أَمْسَكَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ عَنِ الْبِنَى If the one who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stops remembering Allah azza wa jal, the angels stop building his palaces for him. So let us remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala excessively. Let us work towards getting close to our maker subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us use every single minute, every single second that we have valuably to, uh, in, a, in a very pro productive way, to secure a good life in this world as well as the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all to value the time that we have and to do as much good as possible. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa'il al-muslimin min kulli dhamb. Fastaghfiru innahu ta'ala jawadun kareemun malikum baru raufur rahim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Usalli wa ala ashraf al wal-mursaleen Nabiyyina wa habibina wa qurrati a'yunina Muhammad ibn Abdullah Alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi afdalu salati wa atamu taslim amma ba'd Fattakullaha ibadallahi haqqa taqwa My dear brothers and sisters in Islam Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be conscious of him wherever you are Wherever you are We have resolutions that people generally, you know, intend when a new year comes about we're not with the fact that you're supposed to celebrate a new year and things like that. But there's no harm in bringing about a few resolutions as long as they are within the teachings of Islam, within the teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah. So ask yourselves, what are the resolutions that I am going to adhere to in regard to this particular year, 2016? Let us all make firm resolutions that let us work towards upping our levels of taqwa. Let us work towards following the pure teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Because after all, taqwa is something that needs to permeate and govern all of our actions. The minute taqwa is inculcated, it controls us. It, it helps us to adhere to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stay away from all that which Allah azza wa jal has prohibited. Because that is basically what taqwa is all about. Taqwa stems from the root waqaya qiwiqaya, which means to put up a barrier, a, a prevention, a protection. To protect you from what? To protect you from the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how does one go about putting up this barrier? How does one go about putting up this prevention? One goes about doing this by adhering to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and staying away from all that which he azza wa has prohibited. Once an individual asked Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu if I'm not mistaken or one of our salafun al to define taqwa, to define taqwa. And he asked the questioner, have you ever walked down a thorny path? 
Have you ever walked down a thorny path? To which the man, the questioner, he replied in the affirmative, yes, I have. So then the, the, the man asks him, so what did you do whilst you were making your way down this thorny path? The man said, well, I gathered my clothing together. I gathered my clothing together and I made my way very carefully, very gingerly down this path so as to avoid snagging my clothing onto the thorns that were present. So then the man, he said, that is the definition of taqwa. That is the definition of taqwa. So in the metaphor, the path that the man is traversing down is this short temporary life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us all with. A life full of trials and challenges, a, a life full of tests, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Noble Quran. That it is He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who created death and life. For what purpose? To test you all in regard to which one of you is best in terms of deeds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of our sins and open the doors of understanding for all of us. So this life is full of tests, trials and challenges. Full of tests. It is upon us to pass the tests with flying colors. We don't question the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't know in regard to this particular year as to how many tests this particular year may hold. We don't know. All of us, at times we may smile, we may laugh, we may joke, we may talk nicely. But we don't know of the battles that each and every one of us, we are all battling. We are all battling our own battles at the end of the day. We are all going through trials. We are all going through challenges. But even if you are put through a challenge, a trial, don't question the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's work on the concept of tawakkul. Let us place our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Primarily, let's work on taqwa. Secondary, let's work on tawakkul. Where we place our trust in Allah azza wa jal, who is the best disposer of all of our affairs. What does he say in regard to taqwa and tawakkul? Two amazing concepts. The one who adopts taqwa, the one who fears Allah, the one who is conscious of his maker, he subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a way out for him from, from every single problem, from every single predicament. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ease all of our affairs. I mean. وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ And the one who places his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who adheres to the concept of tawakkul, وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُ Then he is sufficient. He is enough for that individual. وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُ So let us adhere, let us perfect this concept of tawakkul where we place our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter the amount of trials, challenges, come what may, we do not lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the end of the day, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not burden a soul more than he or she can endure. Amazing narration. The narration goes along the lines of these words. Once a Sahabi went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and asked him, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, of all the individuals who are the ones tested the most by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said? He did not say, you know, we might think, that he perhaps sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have said the transgressors, the criminals, the ones who have wronged themselves, the sinners. But you know what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said? Al-Anbiya. Al-Anbiya. They are the ones tested the most by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thumma al-amthal fal amthal And then the very next best, after which the very next best. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went on to cap the narration along the lines of these words. An individual is tested according to his levels of iman, according to his levels of righteousness, according to his levels of wara. An individual is tested accordingly. And when you analyze the lives of the Prophet wasalam, it's just amazing. The amount of trials Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the most beloved of creation, the greatest of creation through. When you compare your tests, your challenges with their tests, your tests and challenges just fade away in comparison. They just fade away. You don't have to go into the lives of the other Prophets. If you wish, you can. For example, you go to the life of you go into the life of Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam. Ayyub is basically a synonym for sabr, for patience. You can't talk about patience except that you have to mention Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam. You talk about Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam, the first thing that comes to your head is sabr, patience. Because, the, because of the amount of trials that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam through. But you don't have to go through the lives of the other prophets alayhi salatu wasalam, to derive this particular lesson. Just go into the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The greatest of creation, the most beloved of them all unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
often at a very young age. He lost his father even before he saw the light of day. He loses his mother at a very young age. He goes under the patronage of his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. Then he loses his grandfather. He loses his uncle, Abu Talib. He loses his beloved wife, Khadija, radiallahu anha. The year that he lost his uncle and his wife, that year was known as Amul Huzn, the year of grief, the year of distress, the year of sorrow, because these two tragic incidents literally shook Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were two boulders of support for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during his mission. He loses both of them. He loses his sons. His own people, the people of Mecca, they chased him out. They chased him out from Mecca. And he goes to Ta'if with the message of Islam. Instead of accepting the message of Islam, they not only rejected the message, they deployed street urchins to pelt him and stone him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was bleeding Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And only after that, he fixated his focus towards Medina. And yes, of course, the people of Medina, Ahl Medina, the Ansar, they embraced Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they welcomed him in. But it was after all of these challenges that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam set up base in Medina and from Medina, Islam, the light of Islam spread across the four corners of this world. But say for example, if a pessimist, a person who looks at things from a negative angle, if he had analyzed the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or if he was put in the shoes of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who by the way was the, the greatest optimist to ever walk on the face of this earth, if a pessimist was put in his shoes, he would have lost hope long time ago. He would have lost hope when the street urchins were pelting him with stones. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never wavered. He never lost hope. He could see the light at the end of the tunnel. He could see the silver lining on the dark clouds. As they say, every dark cloud has a silver lining. But at times you need to look a little harder to find that silver lining. But sadly, the issue that is gripping the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam these days is this issue of pessimism, is the issue of negativity. Where we are so negative, we have gone into that abyss of negativity. Come out of it, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. Look at everything from a positive angle. This is a big, huge lesson that we derive from the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At times, the biggest mistake that you and I we make is that we think that our negative perception of a matter is the only reality that exists. No. If you were to look at it carefully, every matter, every situation has a positive angle to it. It's just a matter of how you look at it. It's just a matter of how you look at it. So do not lose hope. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most forgiving, is the most merciful. As you turn over this new chapter in terms of the Gregorian calendar, turn over a new leaf in terms of your ways. Mend your ways. And this is a concept known as Tawbah, where you have to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a regular basis. And this is not something restricted for the sinners. This is not something restricted for the transgressors. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Noble Quran, and look at whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu tubu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuha. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu. And just as Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu is reported have said, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses us as, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, it is upon us to listen more attentively. Now that does not mean that we do not listen to the other ayat attentively, but these particular ayat, we're supposed to listen to them attentively because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is either going to command you to do something or prohibit you from something. So let us listen attentively. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, O you who have brought in iman, O you who have believed, we all consider ourselves people of Iman, yes? So let us listen attentively. Tubu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuha. Turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a sincere tawbah. Allah Azza wa is waiting to forgive us. It's just a matter of us taking the initiative and turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the most forgiving, the most merciful. In a number of places in the Noble Quran, we read, In Allah ghafur rahim In Allah ghafur rahim Indeed, Allah is the most forgiving. Allah is the most merciful. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Each time you read Surah Al-Fatiha, you start off with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah is focusing on His attributes of mercy. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. So never lose hope. Allah is the most forgiving. Let me mention this one beautiful hadith could say and I'll wrap off, inshaAllah ta'ala. The narration goes along the lines of these words. And this narration talks about the individual last to enter Jannah. This individual, he will stumble by Jahannam. And he'll, he'll, he'll move away from Jahannam. And he'll save himself from burning in Jahannam. And then he'll thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He'll glorify Allah azza wa jal. And, and he'll be so grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he made his way away from Jannah. 
And whilst thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, suddenly he'll observe a tree, the far distance, a tree, a tree with a nice shade and perhaps a spring of water. The narration goes along the lines of these words. And he'll cry out to Allah, Ya Allah, he'll pray to Allah, Ya Allah, let me make it until that tree so that I can avail of the shade of that tree and so that I can quench my thirst from, you know, using the water there. Ya Allah, let me make it to that tree. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will address his slave. Allah azza wa jal will address his slave. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Oh my slave, if I were to grant this wish of yours, will you promise me that you will not ask me anything else? To which the slave will cry out, Ya Allah, just grant this wish of mine. Let me make it till that tree and I will not ask you of anything else. I promise. There is this covenant between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah azza wa answers his dua and he scrambles and makes it to that tree and he you know, starts to enjoy the shade of that tree. Whilst doing this, suddenly he sees another tree, a more beautiful tree with a bigger shade and more sweet water gushing from it. He cries out to Allah, Ya Allah, let me make it until that tree, Ya Allah. That tree is so much more beautiful and the shade looks so much more better and I feel that the water must be so much more quenching. Let me make it to that tree, Ya Allah. He cries out unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa Jal will then say to that slave, Oh my slave, did you not promise me that you will not ask of me anything if I, if I were to grant your wish? And I granted your wish. Now here you are, you're asking me something else. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his infinite mercy, he will grant the wish of that man and let him go by that tree. Now he makes it to that tree, he scrambles and makes his way to that tree. And whilst he's under the shade of that tree, he notices another tree, a much more beautiful tree by the gates of Jannah. And then he will cry out, Ya Allah, is by the gates of Jannah. Let me make it until that tree, Ya Allah. And once again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Oh my slave, you do not promise me that you will not ask me of anything. And here you are, now you're asking me something else. But then again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his infinite mercy, he will allow the man to make it until the gates of paradise. No sooner he makes it by the gates of paradise, he will start to observe Ahlul Jannah, the people of paradise. He'll hear their voices, he'll smell the fragrance of Jannah, and he will not be able to contain himself. He'll cry out, Ya Allah! Let me enter Jannah, Ya Allah. I can't contain it anymore. I can't, I can't bear it. Just let me go into Jannah, Ya Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Oh my slave, did you not promise me that you will not ask of me anything after I have granted your wishes? And I did grant your previous wish. And here you are. Now you want to go into Jannah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Oh my slave, if I were to allow you to enter Jannah, and according to another narration, He subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant him a Jannah equivalent to planet earth and 10 times more this is the person entering jannah the last allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say if i were to give you a jannah equivalent to this world equivalent equivalent to dunya equivalent to planet earth and 10 times more will you not ask of me anything else the man will cry out ya allah are you making fun of me ya allah are you making fun of me equivalent to this world and 10 times more me the last person to enter jannah and then at that point, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an, who was narrating the narration, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, this should make shudders run down our spine. You know, this should make shudders run down our spines. And we should tear when listening to this narration. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an, he smiles. And he asks the companions around him, why don't you all ask me as to why I'm smiling? And then they all ask him, Ibn Mas'ud, why are you smiling? And Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he clarifies, whilst Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa, alayhi wa sallam was mentioning this narration, he too smiled. And we all asked him, Ya Rasulullah, why are you smiling? And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa, alayhi wa sallam went on to say, when the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that point, when he says, oh Allah, are you making fun of me? Allah azza wa jal will laugh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will smile and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant his wish. He will laugh, he will smile kama yaliqu bi sha'nihi wa jalali in a manner that befits his majesty and glory. If you were to think that he smiles and laughs like the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then you are mistaken because laysa kamithli he shay that is not, there is nothing in comparison to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, the important point is in regard to the mercy of Allah azza wa jal. He is so forgiving, so merciful, so do not lose hope. Whatever anybody says, Allah Azza wa Jal will most definitely forgive you of your sins. But you need to take the initiative. You need to turn. So let us all turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in sincere tawbah. May Allah Azza wa Jal forgive us of our sins. May He accept our good deeds. And just as how He unites us here in this beautiful masjid, the East London Masjid, may He unite us in the gardens of Jannah with our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, this is a Friday. Do not forget to send excessive blessings and salutations upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. 
اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله